Please welcome back to the stage Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Don Graves. Well, hello again, everyone. I hope you have had a really great day so far. I think the discussions have been fantastic. Uh, those of you who have been in the building, I know we've had great conversations here. Uh, the, the hundreds that are uh, following this at home, hopefully uh, this has been, uh, or at your home office, this has been uh, a really fascinating set of discussions. Well, it is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce our final keynote address of the day. Former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice is the director of the Hoover Institution and currently serves on the advisory council of the Stanford Institute, you all have heard this before, of the, for the Human Centered Artificial Intelligence, or HI. Dr. Rice was the 66th Secretary of State and the very first African American woman to hold that job, serving during the George, Bush George W. Bush administration Prior to that, she served as President Bush's National Security Advisor. Dr. Rice began her career teaching at Stanford, where her knowledge of the Soviet Union propelled her into politics. She's an expert on Russia, something that we were talking about, something that is very vital right now, and an expert on uh, the United States' growing competition with China, as well as navigating AI and innovation. We are incredibly thankful uh, that she's joining us today, and we're very eager to hear her insights. And one last thing, maybe the most important thing, she is also a fellow Cleveland Browns fan, so even, even better. Please welcome Secretary Rice. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Secretary. And um, <clears throat> as to the Cleveland Browns, uh, the one thing that, le that lets you know about us is that we are loyal, if uh, nothing else, and so uh, we look forward to the next year. The great thing about right now is they are undefeated. Um, so uh, it is my honor to have just a few minutes to uh, close what I think has been a very important conference on artificial intelligence and the economy, uh, charting a, a pathway for responsible and inclusive AI. And on that basis, I want to just make a couple of, a couple of comments about responsible in uh, a larger context of what we are watching uh, geopolitically, what we're watching on the world stage, what is being played out most dramatically uh, in Ukraine uh, as this clash of uh, the values of a country and a people that are dedicated to freedom, to their identity, uh, to a sense uh, that they control their own destiny uh, against something that I think we actually thought we wouldn't see again in the 21st century, perhaps it had been uh, done with in the 20th century, was marching armies uh, that are intent on uh, changing the lives of many uh, through military might. It reminds us uh, that the world in which we live is one in which we need to pay attention to the broader context as we think about the emergence of frontier technologies that are in fact capable of changing the way that we live. Very powerful technologies. Everything from the possibility for quantum computing to of course AI, which we've discussed today, to gene editing. These are technologies that, so to speak, in the wrong hands could change the way that we live dramatically for the worse. I live in Silicon Valley, and I can tell you that in Silicon Valley, technology is just good. It just is. There's a kind of assumption that technology will always serve the better angels. But in fact, technology is neutral. And it is the context in which it's applied. It's how it's applied that makes it either good or bad for humankind. I would remind that the same technologies, the splitting of the atom, that allowed us to turn on civil nuclear power, that allowed us to do medical isotopes for disease uh, control, it's the same technology that gave us nuclear weapons. In fact, part of the human problem is that we've often been better about the knowledge part than we have been about the wisdom part. And this time, we need to be very clear about the wisdom part. There is a kind of race out there to harness 
these frontier technologies. And every advanced technological country in the world will be a part of that race. But of course, countries like the United States and of course China will be at the head of the pack. I would suggest to you that this race has implications for human history far down the road. It means that the United States, not to put too fine a point on it, uh, has got to win this race. Again, drawing from history, just imagine if that nuclear weapon had fallen first into the hands of Nazi Germany or into the hands of Stalin's Soviet Russia. We might also have seen a very different course for human history. Now, I am confident that, in fact, the United States and countries that share our values, responsible countries in the world, can, in fact, win the race to harness these technologies for the better. I'm confident for several reasons. First of all, because we innovate broadly we have distributed innovation. We don't have innovation dictated from the top. And eventually, eventually, authoritarians cannot stand alternative centers of power. If you look at what is happening to China's uh, great private companies today, you see this happening. I doubt very much that Jack Ma just wanted to spend more time with his family after all. And so, Innovation that is distributed, coming from many, many different sources, is our strength, because who knows where the answers will come from. It is also the case that we are a country, the United States of America, that has from time to time in our history had exactly the right mix of government support and intervention and private entrepreneurship and private creativity. I am from Stanford University, and Stanford University is one of the places, like MIT and others, that benefited from the wisdom after World War II of Vannevar Bush, who understood that the role of the federal government would not be to pick winners and losers, but rather to invest broadly in the fundamental technologies that might not yet show a commercial path. Indeed, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, and others invested in basic fundamental research in the laboratories of our great universities. It paid off. It paid off in innovation. It paid off in inventiveness. Eventually, it paid off in the commercial success and the economic success that we think of when we think of Route 128 and when we think of the Silicon Valley. Today, we should ask ourselves this question again. What is the role of the US government in supporting our distributed innovation for these frontier technologies? My own belief is that there is a US government role, that investment is key. I've been heartened by the fact that perhaps because we have seen the problems with supply chains and we've actually had to awaken to some of the concerns about our national security and technology, that there seems to be bipartisan support for US government investment in fundamental technologies. And when I say fundamental, I really mean fundamental, where you don't know what the outcome might be. I often tell the story of a good friend of mine, a man named Bill Perry, who at the time when he was testifying was Under Secretary for Research, Engineering, and Development for the Carter Administration. And Bill tells the story, by the way, Bill Perry is one of the smartest people that I know. He tells the story of testifying and being asked about the future of personal computers and saying that he didn't see any earthly idea or any earthly way that people would want personal computers. That was in 1978. Bill always used it as an example that the federal government should not choose winners and losers, but should support broad innovation. 
And so I am hardened by the efforts of the administration, the Biden administration. I know that Secretary Raimondo in particular is a major proponent for that investment and for partnerships from that investment with academia, with the private sector, with those who will really do the work to keep us innovative and ahead. It's a race that matters. It's a race that matters because values matter. Values matter to the development of human history. We have been talking here about responsible. And let me say that responsible to me means that these, these uh, technologies are not used to impede the progress toward human privacy and human freedom, but in fact to further it and to make it even more possible. Just to use one example, facial, facial recognition uh, technologies or AI can be used to track and surveil a population or they can be used to make a population safer. I will bet on the latter from a great democracy with all of its checks and balances and on the former from authoritarians. But it is more than that. The last session on equity is a challenge not just for us, but for every country in the world. We know that technology is not only not just good or bad, but that its benefits have not always been evenly distributed because power, wealth, influence, and access are not evenly distributed, even in the best democracies. And so by asking ourselves these questions now, about responsible and inclusive AI, we are able perhaps to harmonize the relationship between the growth and importance of these technologies, their irreversible forward march, but to harmonize them with the wisdom that will come from a democracy that cares that every technology when in fact be used responsibly and inclusively. Thank you very much for the time that you have spent on this important subject today, and thank you for the thinking that you will continue to do as we try to put this Rubik's Cube together of how to make sure that this time technology is for the good of humankind. Thank you very much.